Well, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this great conversation on community land trust and the opportunities here. I'd like to first say that I've really appreciated meeting the great people, the False Creek Neighborhood Group and Replan, uh, the folks at the Co-op Federation. You have a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and ability and uh, buzz around doing affordable housing and new things. And it'll be very exciting to watch and see how your progress unfolds in this really beautiful world-class city. You have uh, just a tremendous opportunity here. And um, I wanted to say it's always an honor. I've, I've enjoyed traveling a little bit to share our model around the US and, and a little bit more around the world. But it's always a treat to come back to Canada. I was born and raised in Montreal. And I lived in Toronto to do my graduate school work. And so it's just a special treat for me to work with my fellow Canadians sometimes. I was in Montreal for the CHRA uh, conference this spring, and they were looking at permanently affordable home ownership models in that city. And, and uh, it's just been fun to learn what's going on up here and, and to keep up with it. Um, I also wanted to just note that uh, key, key behind a lot of these things and key behind a lot of our work in Vermont is Andy Broderick, who's here tonight, and his a wife, Amy Fitzgerald. And I can say that when we were developing our model in Vermont, Andy came up with some wild and crazy ideas that have actually been part of our sustainability and success. So I think you've somehow stolen him away from us, uh, but I think it's all for the good. So Andy, thank you. So what I wanted to do tonight, instead of going into sort of a slide-by-slide -slide presentation, is realizing you know that I'm probably uh, either you're digesting your dinner or I'm the thing between you and a later dinner. I wanted to tell you a story, a great story about a small city with a big idea. And in that story, sort of you will see unpacked the community land trust model why it worked there, what it addressed, and you can draw for yourself any uh, parallels to what you might be able to do with the model here in and around Vancouver. I know you already have great ideas going, but you can see the parallels and why cities certainly around our country today and seemingly yours are struggling to find new ways, as David said, to be able to sustainably develop, create, support affordable housing, things that will last and be able to recycle your very precious public funding. So the story I'm about to tell you, oh, before I start, I wanted to define CLT for you, for people just sitting there saying, just before we go into this, what, what are we talking about? And no doubt, um, you're all more probably familiar with conservation land trusts, and a conservation land trust takes land out of the market to conserve, you know, env environmentally, to conserve land, to conserve our wildlife and our natural environment. A community land trust, likewise, as you described, takes land out of the market but, and holds it for the benefit of the community, for community benefits and community assets, and in most cases, uh, for affordable housing, which is a great and important community asset, uh, but also in our models, and I will show you some and examples around the country, people use it for other important community facilities, uh, community amenities, and you're a partner with your city, and your, or, or if you choose your county-wide CLT, you're a partner with your local government in really retaining good quality assets for civic purposes. And that's really the root of the CLT mission and vision. So to just break down a wee bit, every community land trust is a nonprofit organization created to hold land for the benefit of the community. And because of its commitment to that, we structure our nonprofit to be a membership organization that elects a board of governors that will keep you in touch with the community. You know, many of our nonprofits, at least, can become very institutional. You have a self-perpetuating board, you do your thing, you know what it is, and then you're a little out of touch potentially with your community. So our boards always have one third the residents of our homes, which definitely keep your feet on the ground about what you're doing. A third, we like public representatives from say local government or how you define the public you're trying to really stay in tune with community development goals. And then general members like another nonprofit. 
We also always have lease terms, uh, not lease terms, we have lease terms, but we have terms for our board members so that we will recycle and maintain that sort of outward vision. So no one can say, well, you just took all this land from our community and you're doing your thing and where, where are we? The other important thing about a community and land trust is its model of tenure. It is definitely something between a cooperative and ownership because in a community land trust, the land is owned collectively. That's what the trust does. But individuals can own the improvements or individual entities like cooperatives or like businesses can own the improvements. And we separate that through a ground lease. And to more in the technical training, we're going to unpack a little bit more uh, what are some of the instruments that are used, but primarily it's a ground lease instrument that allows you to separate the ownership. And then, as in the case of our trust, we like to give as much ownership rights over to the residents on our properties, regardless of what the formal uh, tenure is. So let's go back in time. After we do, I will give you a little visual tour of uh, CHT today and some other land trusts so you can see how the things unfold. But the beginning of my story is quite a ways back in 1981. It was morning in America. It was, yes, for, for many actually, when this was what Ronald Reagan said when he was elected, right? Morning in America. For the pe kind of people we served, it was morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Morning in America, if you were a worker relying on a union or a low-income person relying on government support or a person at risk for HIV. It was a very, very awful administration for regular working people. And he began to dismantle uh, public spending on things like housing. That's when it began, and we have suffered from that since. And also the deregulation that ultimately led to uh, the big crash that we had several years ago. Great time. But at the same time, in the same year, a small northeastern city elected a socialist mayor. So it's 1981, by 10 votes. Well, of course, it's a big shock to people. Uh, you know, also Mr. Gorbachev had not taken down his wall yet. So it was a time where the idea of a socialist mayor was quite scary. I know people think of Vermont as very liberal now. It was a very rural state. It's very, it was very shocking at the time. The city was Burlington, Vermont, as you know from the story, and the mayor was Bernie Sanders, our current senator and uh, recent candidate, yes, for president. Let's give a clap to Bernie. Woo and he played a big role. It was the leadership of a mayor and the leadership of a city that allowed us to grow this vision of a community land trust and spread it as we have around the country and beyond. So how did this happen that this little city would elect a socialist mayor? Well, as, many, as in many cases, we had just a very moribund administration that was doing the same old, same old, not very in touch with the needs of the people, focused on the downtown development and the merchants, and they just assumed they would be um, in, in charge for a long, long time, and they were neglecting the poor, our renters, our neighborhoods were suffering. And, in addition, they had a vision for their city. And uh, when I was in uh, the Falls Creek neighborhood today and walking over, you had a similar roots where we had a post-industrial waterfront on Lake Champlain. And there's still railroad lines, old tank farms. And so this city government had had the vision that they would let the railroad sell the land and develop high-rise condominiums for people who could afford the view, beautiful view, the Adirondacks beyond. And that was their plan. And this was a, uh, had a couple of problems. The first was the wrong plan. But second, we knew it was going to gentrify the lower-income neighborhoods of the city. And there was a lot of speculation and pressure on these. The city has a very sm everything small here. Small postage downtown, small neighborhoods north and south of that that were low-income uh, with uh, poor housing stock, old housing stock, and very poor people who were renters and very subject to the speculative activity that was going on in anticipation of this waterfront redevelopment. And of course, when you're speculating on land, you're not really improving it. They were just holding it and trying to assemble blocks. A constant pressure on housing in our, that little city was, we have a university and two colleges. And so those 
uh, schools that we bring students every year, and that was really affecting our, our rental costs. So the people who elected Bernie were the neighborhood groups that he'd been working with, tenants, advocates, and they got out to vote, and they decided it was time for change and wanted to be heard, uh, and they, they succeeded by those 10 votes. In fact, a, a local rabbi, Sugarman, he actually, they locked up the ballots, it was paper, of course, eh? and, uh, in the vault, and he sat uh, guard over them all night because so sure was he that those votes would disappear. And people got up the next day hoping, but no. Uh. And then uh, just the environment that we were in a state, to remember that Vermont was a very, very rural state. And at the time, we did not have much planning and zoning. It's a small town. There's no county government. And so it, it was really a high property rights state. It's like rural state, high property rights, high gun right, right, rights in the U.S. Don't mess with our land. So these were some of the obstacles we would have to overcome. We said we're going to do a community land trust, and we're going to hold the land in trust communally. This was a, a great challenge for us in that environment that ultimately we did overcome. So the city issues as that brought bringing to the fore with the city issues we would end up trying to address to our, and address through our community land trust. Um, the high cost of housing, the poor state of the neighborhoods that needed improvement, but um, we did not want to gentrify them in the sense that the people who live there would not be able to live there again. There's good gentrification, right? Improve, uh, create value, provide amenities, make our neighborhoods as good as our downtown, which was pretty decent then but not this place. So that was a challenge. And then the challenges that Bernie faced as a new mayor in this environment was that we have a very, it was a very low power for a mayor model. Um, the mayor had two-year terms. He didn't have many friends on the council then, of course, maybe two people. And also our model was that every city department had a commission of its own appointed by the city council. So he was not going to be able to overcome the, the resistance of those departments. It, it's not a good system anyway, but I've already, broke it. I've already broken your equipment. I think someone will have to fix the battery. Get a little excitement. Okay. So there was a big challenge in how we would move forward with this agenda, okay? And uh, that's important because the community of interest really fit into the solutions that ultimately the mayor had to uh, devise. And he continued to galvanize the support of the, obviously the groups that had elected them and didn't have many resources for them. So after struggling for a couple of years, he did manage to create a community development office that would answer directly to the mayor and that would bring in resources and, and use them for citizen-led initiatives and for the citizen initiatives that mattered. He was the same Bernie, some of you may have heard speak in the campaign about engaging citizens for their own solutions. He's very committed to that. He literally blew open the doors of City Hall, invited people in. It was a very, and in fact, one of the lasting legacies is the citizen engagement that we have in that city. The Community Development Office provided a workaround because, you know, it was the beginning of the 80s, so there were actually still many federal programs available to cities that this city had not been accessing because it didn't really care about the housing. And so we knew at the Community Development Office, that's when I went to work with him as housing director, that we would be able to bring money into the city and use the money that he was uh, discovering in the bad books of the city. And that's what we did. And our model was not to create government programs and do things for, but to, to do things by and with the citizens that had uh, need, and that was my mission to go out and meet with the tenant groups and neighborhood groups, start addressing the housing issues with them. And we did a lot of the conventional things. We brought in funds for rehab and stuff. But we were looking for a, a way to sort of bypass the private ownership, public housing ownership. Nobody likes public housing in the U.S. Uh, not to do everything as a government top-down program. And this is how we came to discover the community land trust model. And at the time, there was an organization called the Institute for Community Economics that was promoting community land trust and also uh, community loan funds as bringing capital and land into the hands of poor people. And, you know, it was a, you didn't Google things then. There was no Internet. So, but anyway, one of our allies, uh, Terry Bush, just discovered the model, and we started looking at it. And one of the reasons we did was we also thought we may need a vehicle like a trust 
to make the land on the waterfront public. One of Bernie's big goals and achievements uh, was that we have a very public-oriented waterfront, lots of citizen access. I have a lot of affordable housing on the waterfront, which I think makes it really an accessible waterfront. And to achieve that, we thought we'd have to get the land from the railroad in trust. But in the end, we had a different solution there that was resolved for the land, and we were able to take the trust and look at what it could do for housing. And at the time, there were two cities in uh, Cincinnati and Atlanta that were using the trust to protect their neighborhoods from gentrification because they could, with help collectively, own the land and still provide home ownership to traditional housing models in their neighborhood. And we thought, wow, that could really help the old North End, and we, we need to look into this. Which, and we studied it further and saw we could meet our goals. The other thing that meant a lot to us was that we could provide home ownership in this model, and we could invest in it, and not just the point at that time of keeping it affordable, but just to make it really affordable and accessible to our residents. Because in the 80s, um, our interest rates were in the double digits, and it was very, very hard. Right, to get a mortgage, and it was making it costly. So Burlington was, and it does remain, a very high-cost city, very expensive city, very, it's like, in the sense, although we're so small and you're so big, but every inch of ground has great, great value. Everybody wants to develop there. So our thing was to battle with this competitive forces, and how would you take that wealth of our civic land and convert some of that wealth for civic need instead of letting it all go into market. And I would say that the biggest contribution of the Burlington model and the one that affected the, the movement of community land trusts and the, develop, the evolution of it and the growth was the city CLT partnership. Obviously, Bernie was not afraid to get up and say, you know what, we want all the investments we make in affordable housing to go into nonprofits so the, re, the value we create will be retained and we will not lose it to market and we won't have to keep raising more and more money. We also made the case as a, a conservative case, which we all have to make now, there's such a shortage of funds, to say that we, are, um, we can't invest money in housing and let it go to market and have to do it again. We need to create models where the housing can remain affordable and our investments recycle for the future. And that was a real commitment of the city. So over the next couple of years, we started developing our community land trust. We brought in an organizer. We took it to the citizens. Bernie would always say, take the citizens. If 100 people come to city council, we'll get the votes. And that's what we did. Um, and people went to work on creating what would be uh, our board, you know, all the elements of the structure of the organization so that it would be uh, Burlington's, and I think as David mentioned, the model is very different in different places because it's very adaptable uh, to your priorities. And by 1984, we were able to incorporate and start doing our first homes. The other contribution of the city was really funding. They gave us a, a seed grant to help get up our operations, and then uh, dedicated pension funds from the city pension and they were matched by a local bank to allow us to go out and compete in this speculative market and, and buy up uh, rental housing and keep people from being displaced. And those were our starting sources. But over the years, and in this part of the story, this goes beyond Bernie to his successor, Mayor Peter Clavel, who became known, in spite of our small city, as one of the big affordable housing mayors of, with Mayor Menino from Boston. Uh, in the U.S. because of his commitment to creating and preserving affordable housing, and he had the same ethics. So over this time, we taxed ourselves to create a housing trust fund to fund permanently affordable housing. The city created the policy that said all housing has to be permanently affordable housing if we invest in it. We created inclusionary zoning, which requires every development in the city to have 15% affordable, 25% uh, on the waterfront, so we even have more affordability. And ultimately, we worked with advocates around the state to create similar resources at the state. And the change there, this is a very, sometimes your big challenges are also, you, you have to seize them as opportunities. And I, in our state, we had a lot of uh, privately developed, publicly subsidized affordable housing from the early 70s, or Nixon programs. But there's a lot of good housing developed from them. And they were expiring. So this is where it goes to the story of your leases. 
they were expiring and they would all go to market. And in other parts of the state, they might be the only rental housing in that community. But we had a large development in Burlington of 336 homes, which is huge at the time in Vermont. And so the, we were able to advocate with others in the state to create a trust fund to preserve that. And Vermont was about to create a conservation trust fund to, pr to protect farmers from the whole gentrification movement and development. And so we came together. So we have a housing and conservation trust fund in Vermont that funds affordable housing, conservation, historic preservation, and ag uh, preservation. So we created tools. And this is a very important part of, I think, the lesson. And you see that partnership of public and private, city or state, and, and a nonprofit leverages together an extra power of funding. And we started using these resources then to really improve our properties, to do new development, um, and to uh, you know, be able to, to fund things long term. So I'm going to switch to bring you to the present and show you Champlain Housing Trust today. And as we look at some of these uh, projects, let you know how this has evolved. And um, I do have also a section on home ownership because the biggest innovation, and this is the one we won the United Nations Award for in real estate, was for us to separate land and improvement for residential real estate. It was not done. There were a lot of hurdles in the industry to get people to mortgage on that kind of a deal and so on. And so that was our biggest hurdle. And, and, and if people were nervous when Bernie was elected, when he started saying, we're going to create home ownership and the and land will be owned communally. You know, some of these people were stocking canned goods in their basement. I mean, I was like, what? No, he's nationalizing the land. And so we had a bigger hurdle in a sense from having such strong um, advocacy in an organization called HALT, Homeowners Against the Land Trust, was formed and they protested. It was really realtor driven. People were very nervous that we were really going to mess with the industry. And you will see over three decades time that not only is our model uh, large, but it's very well accepted in our community and everybody lends on them. And so good things take time sometimes. But now we can benefit from each other's experience and it takes less time each time. Okay, so I'm going to take you to, I think I really did break this thing. So we'll try it on the computer. I'll find your part. All right, so today we have through with 300 million in assets under our stewardship and about an 11 million dollar operating budget. We manage a lot all our property maintenance, so that is added. We now serve the three county area from Burlington, Vermont up to the border, and we have within that service area our urban market, a suburban market and very very rural. And that's about a third of the state's population. And I will say that's an advantage big cities have when you start scale helps, scale matters. Housing and land obviously is high capital uh, rich uh, endeavor and highly technical. And it helps to have that. Each year we generate about 100 million though in development with our operating budget. And the developments we do, the new construction, uh, the mortgages that we leverage. And so we're seen as really now an economic engine uh, in our region. And today we have 2,800 homes or so, 580 in the shared equity home ownership portfolio, and 90 employees. And this is how we operationalize our mission. And this really comes from our beginnings in the neighborhood where it wasn't about one kind of housing or one kind of tenure, but giving people security of tenure, right? all the way along the continuum. And we call this our continuum of afford housing affordability, which includes a portfolio of every kind of housing, special needs housing, housing for emergency, for homelessness, uh, rentals, uh, cooperatives, condominiums, home ownership, single family. And we wrap them in some services and supports that allow our folks to succeed. And our, our vision is security first. You know, housing is really security and opportunity because many, many people have moved up this ladder. Uh, and we track them and become homeowners. But the first things first uh, is your secure housing. So starting at the beginning of that continuum, we did many shelters, uh, housing for people with homelessness. And right now, this is a, a big area that we've had to move into to, to uh, fill out what's being done in our community. 
And uh, most recently, the hospital gave us $3 million to help us build more uh, homes for people who are chronically homeless and chronically ill. So it's really, that's an example of your mission having to be outward focused and responding to different needs. And I should say, uh, most we have a big portfolio of rentals. In our case, our rentals serve the workforce because uh, our workforce is very rent burdened and cannot afford our, mar our market rents are the rents that you see in Boston. And here we are in this little city in Vermont. People are not making the wages to make that. Um, and so that is an important part of our mission. And then we deeply subsidize some of those to serve people who've been homeless or the very low income. So 30% of those almost, over 20%, are serving very low income and the rest serve the workforce. Here's an example. This is on the waterfront, the only rental housing on the waterfront. We made affordable rental. It was the first residential green building uh, in the state. And that is LEED certified, if that means anything. Yes, we did this with our partners, Andy. And uh, the city assembled this land as brownfield on the waterfront. Um, and it is on a long-term lease to the city. It's the one piece of land we do have a long-term lease to them. So we're proud of that. We had to share the award, we, the prize we won with Andy's outfit. And yes, yeah, so we share. And then uh, to see the adaptability, we do, uh, obviously we do properties with commercial space because that's a design element you need in a city. So as we re developed a lot of downtown and other neighborhoods, on the left is a, was built on a brownfield and downstairs is the credit union that serves the unbanked and brings them in, makes them, banks, we are a refugee resettlement community and we have a lot of refugees uh, and housing on top. So that's an example of how we can mix it. Yeah. That's right. He's a Canadian. I know all the Canadians in Vermont. We have like a we have a secret handshake and and uh, we we go out in a boat whenever we're together. Drive, drive everybody nuts. Um, all right. So and this was a big transportation site with bus barns and but these dark bus barns were nice and again this is another one Andy had to put together a whack, wacky deal. There's housing, there's commercial, there's a nonprofit that repairs donated cars and provides them to people who don't have transportation. That's, that's public transportation in a rural place. And uh, that was a wacky one. That was good. Raised a lot of capital there. And uh, new construction, this is our office now, our new headquarters, two floors of office, two floors of rental. And this is the beginning of the redevelopment of a block which is a typical thing, right? When you do community development, first one in. Now it has a boutique hotel and condominiums and such. This is to show in our rural market, this is on the edge of the biggest city up there, St. Albans, and it was a factory. So even in the rural, we do a lot of housing that is different, but this was, uh, they created, um, they provided uniforms during the war and they made blue jeans and we made these beautiful, uh, these are very green apartments. They're not LEED certified, but this is a lovely development. And then we have redeveloped facilities for nonprofits. We've done two community health centers, there's legal aid offices. Um, and in this case, this was uh, really revitalization in the old North End neighborhood. We started in, cleaned up a lot of brownfields. There were big industrial sites. So we didn't want to do housing everywhere. But the other advantage, I talked about the city CLT partnership, and one of the great things is as a nonprofit, we can bring in different resources to the city. You know, I don't have the power of taxation. I would love it, but the city has that. We have a, but we, we can raise money. And for the nonprofit facilities, we had to have charitable campaigns and major donors will put money in the buildings. And part of what they said, um, was a good motivation for them was they knew the land trust would, would keep the property and community use. And certainly some of these have changed. The health centers have been to many different nonprofits, but we are the stewards. You know, we are holding that community asset. This is just more downtown revitalization, just to show you how bad some of our properties were that we were able to re redevelop. This one good. And these are our housing cooperatives, very proud of these. We just finished a 40 apartment cooperative in our target area neighborhood, the North End, that people are moving into probably as we speak. And uh, many of our cooperatives are zero equity. 
Um, and we are actually master leasing the rights of a cooperative to tenants. So, but their people are very dedicated to them and um, really feel ownership because of the control they have. We provide technical services to the co-op board training and we manage these properties. So now I want to focus on home ownership, that unique part, and tell you a little bit about that program. Um, so I've already described, in addition to having homes in the program, we do home buyer education for everybody, so people will choose the shared equity model if they can't go into the market. And we are really built our program around that. Um, and we do a lot of financial counseling, and now we do it for renters too, to help them get in and get budget safe and succeed as renters. So here's just a look to see the variety, the diversity of our portfolio. We have homes in the city. We have a lot of condominiums. Same thing as our other uh, portfolio. Oh, here's this little. These are uh, manufactured homes built in Canada that we brought down Route 7 from Quebec. They're very, very nice design. They've worked well. They're, they're uh, condominium home ownership. Um, and as you see, a great variety. So here's our program design. And the thing about the community land trust and these elements of program is you design it for what works in your market and your community. And so ours is built around our hot market and our need to create affordability over time. So we have a restricted uh, resale formula that, to balance the present and future affordability. And we use the market value. We appraise what first purchase, we appraise what they sell for the next purchase. And what people get is 100% of their mortgage pay down. That's theirs, right? 100% of the appraised value of the capital improvements, but only 25% of our market appreciation. And I'll show you that we, we look at this regularly, make sure our formula still works, and it does still work to create continued affordability and, and also to build wealth for the people who are selling. And we, sell, we do this to people up to 100% of median income. And like Dudley Street, we step in every time. So people always ask this, and I did know when we started our trust, you could see that we needed startup money, we needed development capital, and we've used every source available since. And in home ownership, we really had to create a lot of the resources. No one was subsidizing home ownership in this way. So we get inclusionary zoning in the city of Burlington, and now towns around Burlington are doing it. Um, we have grants that we let people go and find homes. Now we have about 24 resales a year, and those homes are just getting more affordable in relation to market. So people come through our course can look at those um, and shop and buy the home they want. We get discounted sales, uh, bargain sales of property. We have done conversion from market rental to our affordable co-ops. And sometimes we repair foreclosures and bring them back to market. Our state has created a home ownership tax credit that we use. We'd like to have a lot more of that, um, but at this point, it's new. And I mentioned this, that today I already mentioned this, that after many years, and I think this is one of the breakthroughs we made in Vermont that helped the model to grow around the country, was we broke the barrier with lenders, now 41 different lenders are loaned to us. Today, our credit unions are our big lenders, um, and we've had a, done a great volume of mortgage for our folks. So let's look at, does this program work the way we said? Are there benefits to buyers? Well, because, you know, when we did it, the objections were you're restricting home ownership. People are not going to make create wealth for themselves. And certainly we didn't want to do that. And, in fact, the only objection to the land trust that Bernie ever raised when we first brought it to him was, are you creating second-class home ownership for working people? Because they should get all the benefits anybody gets. And then we showed them that we're actually boosting people who be renters all their lives and that, that they would still create wealth. So what people get is we get them into an A mortgage. You know, they get the home buyer counseling. But right away, because we put 20% down for them, they're getting saving three to 400 a month on their mortgage. And they, they're part of the trust. We're never going to let them just go into delinquency without checking in and helping them and doing workouts or counseling, whatever they need. And that's why the, the figures you quoted from Boston, we have less than uh, uh, foreclosure than any market housing. And many of our folks, you'll see, use this as a stepping stone to market. So we have created a new stepping stone of tenure. It's one that works. You could leave your house to your child. You can own it outright, but you could also 
move, use the equity, and go into the market, which many of our buyers do. And one of the things in our market, in the Seattle markets like this, is from the moment they get into our mortgage and this deal, people are saving three to $400 as against renting. And, you know, you're not building any wealth in renting. So we think that's a great boost for the people we serve. So have we maintained access, I'm sorry, to lower-income buyers? We continue to serve people at an average of about 69% median income in our hot market. That's an exceptional record. And it can, we can stay at that affordability in spite of our market inflation because ours become more affordable over time. Homeowners build wealth in our program. They don't have to put much money down, so the return on investment is much higher, 2.5 times bigger than anything they could, um, you know, working people can't invest in the market and make any kind of money. You're not going to make money on your savings accounts today. So getting them into home ownership this way, in fact, people are building wealth. That's been an important selling point for us, for the movement around the country. I mentioned this, two-thirds of our uh, buyers, when they sell, go on to buy in the market. So they're not trapped in this program. You can't say they're not building enough wealth because they're using it to get into market. And that's a good outcome. Are we meeting the benefits of the community, right? Because the community land trust balances the interests of the community for long term and the, and the interests of the people you're serving. So we have retained access to home ownership in this hot market, still at a low income. We are retaining and recycling the public benefits, and we leverage a lot of private dollars in our economy, as you saw with the mortgages. And in this, we're able to improve housing stock. I'll show you some slides. So this is how our affordability tracks against market. Whoops, didn't advance, I'm sorry. Uh, tracks against the market. So as you can see, it was steady on. You see where the crash came. In our region, the real estate really didn't crash. It was a flattening out. We had, But we had great economic decline after, which really affected working people who lost their jobs or their retirements or hours. And that's what we've been dealing with a lot since. And I just want to show the important, I think this is very important when you're trying to get people to spend money on your programs, especially in the public sector, that with the funds, because we recycle the benefit at each resale, we've been able to serve two and a half more households with the funds that the public gave us than we could have in a conventional program. Plus, remember, they're still there to continue to support buyers well into the future because we leave our value with the property. Or you could look at it the other way, that the, the public money we got, it would have cost, it was five times less money uh, than people would have paid in a conventional. So we were able to really retain the public benefit while we're still helping people move on. So I'm just going to show you some slides now on the variety of work done. This is the first condominium uh, building. Uh, this is another wild one you brought me. Oh, my God. We did this in like five minutes in a parking lot or something. We decided to buy this building. So, really. Um, half of it was community land trust. Half of it is market. They're all affordable. It was the first time that was mixed. And people wondered, would, would they market? Would people buy the market once they sold like hotcakes? It was just before the crash. Um, and here is what can be done now, and this is being done in, around the country, is taking foreclosed properties that are boarded up. We didn't have that many. We were able to do this. And because we were investing for the long term, we, we invested a lot in these and made them highly energy efficient. This is our 500th home. And, you know, when you do this in a neighborhood, you're, um, you're helping all the other homeowners in the neighborhood, right, on the block, because they're affected. So we're really deeply invested and they recycle. This homeowner sends me a card every year on the anniversary of buying this home. Sweet. So you mentioned the spread of community land trusts and uh, the 300 across the country now in almost every state, very heavy on the coast. We're having our National Land Trust Conference starting September 26th in Park City, Utah. So if anybody wants to come and delve even deeper and meet the great community of community land trust folks, that's a good opportunity. But the story, as I mentioned, is really our story is that of the municipal support for CLTs, and many, many cities came to visit us while we were doing this. And Boston, you mentioned, um, was one of the first adopters in the 80s. And what the city gave them was the power of eminent domain. Do you call it eminent domain here? So they had the right to get those blighted properties in hand and redevelop. I'd love to get that, or land. But. And then 
Uh, Albuquerque is an example where the city cleaned up a huge brownfield by the railroads and then gave it to them, knowing it would all be in trust. They've done a whole mixed income neighborhood. And they partner with developers. And that from that piece of land now, Albuquerque is asking them to develop around the city. And here's what's going on in the rest of the country. If we have a minute, I won't take too much time. People obviously doing uh, single-family homes. Manufactured housing is a big rural housing stock and giving the people opportunity to collectively buy the land, keep their lot rents good, be able to improve their homes and create community. That is a big uh, activity. Here's San Francisco where they do mostly their land just with limited equity co-ops, but they also have a shared equity program. And a um, lot of the community land trust now doing very high uh, energy efficiency. Uh, so. You know, and you can see the range of you, the, the variety of applications that you're a very big city and it can't be compared to, to Burlington, but people have adapted and are doing the housing stock that's most uh, needed in their regions. And then we do commercial development, but, you know, as a, as a needed planning thing. But in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, they're actually using the land trust for economic development to support the startup of small businesses and to maintain them in their neighborhoods, which is great. Um, you know, we know about home ownership. We have co-housing developments. Uh, and we have a couple, and many land trusts have, have them where they want to provide affordability. And then outside of Vermont, you know, we have a a lot of conservation trusts, but in other places, the uh, community land trusts are doing conservation for agriculture, uh, CSAs for urban farming, which is a big growth thing in our depopulating cities. Um, we've done some neighborhood parks, and again, that's a great need in other communities, and the commercial spaces and uh, job creation. So we have our Grounded Solutions Network is our National Community Land Trust Network, and they provide now services to all bottles of permanent affordability. So while there's only like 300 land trusts, there's 600 shared equity permanently affordable homeownership programs around the country. That took off like wildfire in the U.S. Uh, as compared to other parts. And, and we provide these services technical assistance. We're funded by the Lincoln Institute and the Ford Foundation. And they're a great resource if you go online. A lot of the stuff is accessible, uh, free. And also the, you can see the opportunities for webinars and trainings. I encourage anybody who's going to do a land trust to join us. Um, and I did want to mention that beyond the U.S., the cities that have really adopted the trust on our model are London. The East London CLTs completed its first project is uh, vying for the uh, post-Olympic lands that the city's going to provide some affordable housing there. And they're going to become a hub CLT, not just to East London, but to develop in boroughs around London. And it's been really exciting. I think they're, they're the kind of city you are where it's astronomical and everybody wants to own property there. And they're really um, fighting the, the tide. And then in Brussels, uh, Belgium has really adopted and is funding community land trust. Brussels has two projects under their, their wings, and they're, they're going great. So here are the resources, and I think I've taken enough of your time. I can take questions if you have time for that. Or Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hello. I'm a PhD student from SCARP. Um, I have a question about, um, I, think, I see there must be um, a support from the city government, because I, we can imagine that um, community land trust, when they buy a piece of land, mm -hmm. they want to do as affordable housing, they build in multi-families, but yes. the zoning designation will re may, may require is to be single family. Yes. So, so you have to get the support from the city government to yes. do the rezoning things. Do you think there's a necessity, necessity for the community land trust to get support from the city government? Thank you. I think that where land trusts have been very successful and grown is where there is the partnership that I described, the city uh, and, and community land trust, because not only I mentioned the resource side, but you're right. You can be partners in development. There were a lot of things that the city couldn't do just through zoning, et cetera, in the old North End. They were able to use us as a tool. I could subdivide property for different uses, even if the zoning didn't allow it to subdivide. You know, and you're right that 
even in planning and as a community development strategy, that partnership is very, very strong and useful. It's not to say some community land trusts are struggling against their local government, but it really limits your growth if you don't have that. So that's why in our network used to be all just CLTs, the Grounded Solutions Network nationally. And then we realized the real action is, is cities around the country are struggling. You know, the feds devolve it to the states and the states devolve it to the cities and the cities have no one to say come and they have to solve their housing problem. The homeless people are on your sidewalks. You know, your workers are, I said this before today, people are driving 40 miles to work in your city. You can't, your school teachers can't live there. So cities have to respond. So now we're providing a lot more service to cities who just want to do any kind of permanent affordability. And many of them then as a second step are deciding to partner with a community land trust to do the stewardship of the properties over time, you know, resale and single family and so on, so that they're not having to be, you know, housing practitioners. Sir? Hi, Poseidon knee, father of Sablefish, father of all women, Raven Tribe, Ganhata, expressing appreciation for the privilege of gathering here. I think SFU does that sometimes. Hi, Siam Siaya. Uh, looking back a decade or so in the excited states of America, um, it seemed that it was a pretty pernicious process that led to uh, 08, 09, uh, knowingly yes. sucking people into uh, mortgage arrangements, which they never have been, never should have been inveigled into entering into. Uh, would you say that the film The Big Short basically uh, tells the story with reasonable accuracy? And would you agree that it was a uh, tremendously uh, pernicious process and uh, could, sh could such evil uh, assert itself again? Yes, it could. It's already underway. The problem wasn't solved. You know, there was a consequence for the people who did that. Um, and I think that we, you constantly have to watch the markets. Uh, I think that film depicts, you know, a certain kind of strategy that people were using to, you know, the betting against your own mortgage securities. But the whole system was riddled with it. And to say that people didn't see it coming, those of us just working in the field, you know, with homeowners, we knew, we saw people were going and getting instruments to, that they couldn't afford to pay and that things were not going to work out. So that's why we created our home ownership centers and provide home buyer counseling. And the reason that community land trust homeowners are more successful is that they have this support network that would never let them get into subprime. Um, and uh, part of that's education. Part of that is we won't qualify someone who's not in a proper mortgage. So that's a very important thing to do. And we're trying, and that's part of our national advocacy, is now that we have the evidences in, we've been the subject of many studies nationally in the portfolio, to say, look, federal government, there's a better way to do this. Don't just sub subsidize the capital markets. Don't do it through that. Do it through these networks of people who actually work with people to succeed in home ownership. We're making some headway. We're going to be in the new, uh, we're going to financial reform, and we're actually written into the bill so that um, banks now will have to loan in the structure and we'll have to provide the instruments needed, and we're just part of their duty to serve now. So these things take a long time. Who said don't don't take no for an answer? We had a lot, you know, it takes a long time to overcome, but I think it's so worthwhile to the national housing picture to change over to permanent affordability and, and funds that can be targeted to people who need it in the neighborhoods that need it, it's worth going on. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was, did community land just insulate Vermont from that uh, thing? First of all, though, the by market, our real estate did not crash, but also Vermont is small C conservative, whatever you hear, and this is a good thing on fiscal matters. We had very high banking regulation. Sometimes even we chafe against their regulations, but um, it was hard to do subprime in Vermont. And we had more local banks, we had more credit unions, and it was difficult. So it was the, people could get a subprime loan online, but we didn't have that street corner presence that was in neighborhoods. And it was more pernicious than you think. Neighborhoods, of African-American neighborhoods were targeted to go in where people had owned their modest home forever and told, take this mortgage and you can fix up your house and you know, value will be there. And so many poor people lost their homes who were already were quite secure. And this uh, crash was a huge, huge transfer of wealth from the very poor. 
to the wealthy. So that was the worst thing about it. But Vermont did insulate itself by having a lot of good policy. And would you add anything to that about Vermont? Sir? Yes, good evening. Uh, Blair Hewitt speaking. I was born here in uh, Vancouver. I'm not familiar with the Boston situation. <clears throat> here in Vancouver, affordable housing is defined as housing, say, $1,000 to $1,200 a month, mm -hmm. which is triple the maximum allowed in uh, welfare rates. Mm -hmm. In effect, the people who need the housing the most are completely uninvolved in the program. Uh, the so-called affordable housing is triple what people on welfare can afford. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really apply to them at all, to the most needy people at all receiving no assistance from it. How does uh, Boston define affordable housing and what multiple of the welfare rates is that in Boston? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We define affordable housing really, for the federal funding we use, which we still have to use, uh, we do use a lot of that, as being 30% of, if their housing should be 30% of their income. And so when we're serving that 30% of our homes that we're serving lower income people, we have to have a rent subsidy for folks who are on welfare or who are on social security or disability income. Uh, our rents are not low enough alone for that. But what our development model does is we create the, the apartment so affordable that it costs less to subsidize it than down to lower income folks so that you're able to serve more people. Our conventional uh, rents uh, are about two thirds of what the market costs and we uh, build them so that um, we provide the uh, energy efficiency that we include heat and hot water which is not done at all in our market. So those work for moderate income people, working people, then we have to get further subsidy to serve the very low income. Does welfare in fact provide any of those subsidies for the... Not for the, through welfare. People get a welfare payment and you're right, it wouldn't on its own... What, it multiple, of the, the what multiple of the maximum allowed for housing <clears throat> for a welfare recipient is the affordable housing. Here in Vancouver, it's triple what oh, welfare I'm people... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining rent subsidy. If you're very low income, your rent alone won't work at the... You, HUD, through our housing authorities, provides you with... You pay 30% of your income, so if you're on welfare, it's 30% of your payment. And then this subsidy pays me, the social landlord, the balance, the 70%. So we use those throughout our portfolio for the most low-income people. Does that happen very often? Yes. Yeah, yeah, most of our portfolio. And by the way, you're reminding me that Burlington's big vision, yes, we're still a very expensive city, but 20% of our rental housing is price restricted by income permanently as a result of all this effort over the years. Okay, thanks. Thank just, you very much. Just as a point of information, the, the affordable, so-called affordable housing that's often advertised in Vancouver is triple the maximum that people on welfare can afford. So the affordable housing movement has virtually nothing to do with the most needy people whatsoever. Yes, I hear you. That's important okay, thank point. you. Very valuable, thank you. Looks like I'm next. Looks Hello, my name is Rosemary Cooper. I have a, a question about the shared equity home ownership. I think it's much easier to get pe folks rallied around rental here than uh -huh. it around, is around home ownership. Mm -hmm. um, so, my question is one, how, how did you make that case? Mm -hmm. And then also, how do you determine the percentage of median income? So when I looked at shared mm -hmm. equity, for yes. example, in London, it can go all the way up to 120% of median income yes. um, because it's just so incredibly un unaffordable. Yes. So those yes. are my, my two okay. questions. Okay. So our median income is set by, you know, they do census annually, and that's updated by HUD to set the median income for your region. And so we all have to follow the same standard, and it is by, by family size, right? So you qualify for certain programs if you're at 60% median or 50% median. So when we do rental housing, we are meeting the income requirements of the, the funds that we're using, and it, it aligns with our mission, so that's fine. Although the old programs used to serve people up to 80% median, and I wish we could now because a lot of the workforce still can't pay market rent and don't qualify for the low, low, okay? And then the reason, how do we get people to be interested in home ownership? Vermont was a very high home ownership state. You know, Burlington was one of the few markets with rent, a lot of rental. 
And that was the value people had. So uh, it was more of a concern to people I couldn't afford to buy anymore. Um, and also, you know, in the U.S., uh, home ownership is further incented through the tax code. So really, there's so much value to people getting into home ownership. It's an important community development tool. And also, outside of a few major jurisdictions like New York, renters don't have many rights in the U.S. It is not like here. Renting's a bad deal by and large in the U.S. And as the, you know, we've lost uh, two affordable apartments for every one that's been added since through, you know, the last couple of decades. And in this, that market, people are renting really horrible places for high incomes and really being impoverished by the lack of decent, affordable housing. It's a big, big issue, and it is why we pay attention to that side of our continuum as well. Thank you. My name is Ian Theaker. I'm a grad student at UBC Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability. Um, whenever I think about real estate, and I'm studying it right now, it always comes down to the money. And mm -hmm. so you've been talking about a really interesting partnership between nonprofit and the city. Mm -hmm. um, but I got to figure that, and you also mentioned credit unions, that I got to mm -hmm. think that there's a pretty good partnership there that I would hope that if somebody from Van City, you might be able to give them some advice. I think that's a very good idea. I think we know some people there too. I think. Uh, they're moving their way towards uh, doing housing. I did want to mention on the money thing, I didn't make this clear, that today the Champlain Housing Trust earns uh, three quarters of our budget, 75% of our budget is earned income. So we get paid from our rents, uh, rental fees, we take development fees when we develop, um, the home ownership resale, we get a development fee. And so we strive to be that social enterprise that our portfolio of homes is very secure for people because we're not raising money hand to mouth. And the other 25% we raise, you know, through foundation grants and public grants and competition, we do fundraising, we've built an endowment and so on. So um, it's hard enough to raise the 25%. Hi, um, and sorry, I don't have a great voice tonight. Um, I'm Deborah Littman. I'm the lead organizer of Metro Vancouver Alliance, which is a broad-based community organization in Vancouver. And um, we're very interested in the issue of community land trust. We've been uh, talking to West Vancouver about a possible uh, use of a, a package of land that they've bought, quite a small one, but at least as a start. Um, but one of the questions I had was, um, in a city like Vancouver, the pressure from com commercial development mm -hmm. is so high. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you drive down some of the main streets, there's huge assemblies of land. There's, you know, you just see the changeover happening constantly. And to have a community land trust, you're going to have to compete with mm -hmm. that pressure. And I'm just curious, you know, how you've done that, what some of the strategies have been. No, this is a very important question and it's hard but even as you see it slipping away and land becoming more valuable, it's never more important than to do it now. It'll never be more affordable than now. So it's a pre you know a pressure, um, and and I just want to salute your work because it's really advocacy that gets things changed. And I'm going to give you. I get to give an opinion, right? Because I'm a speaker. I'm going to opine here, and I'm going to say this. And it's a lesson we try to get. I'm trying to give to all the cities I'm working with. Cities create enormous value. You know, we think of developers as creating value, and they do, and they add. But you, when you create public transit, those locations that those transit, right, they have huge value. If a city creates, a, improves its waterfront. And it's totally legitimate for the city not to give all its wealth away to the first person who comes and says, I'm going to develop it. The city has a right to that wealth to create community benefit. Even when you upzone, you're creating value. So a developer comes in there and says, well, I want to develop this and that, but I need this concession, that concession. I, no, we created this value for you. And especially a city like this, where people aren't going to walk away and just uh, develop somewhere else. The demand is so great. And I urge cities to think more like capitalists. You know, they, In our country, they always say, oh, the government should be more like the private sector. Well, they don't mean it. They mean you should give everything to the private sector. Well, we, but if communities valued their wealth, what developer would ever give away his land to you or give away his value? You know, 
No, and we're not going to give our land away or our value, but communities need to start to understand and own the value that they create and, and use it for the civic things they want to see happen. And you know what? They have a great bargaining place at that table. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Hi, thank you. Michael Alexander. I'm director of uh, SFU's City Conversations program. And in Vancouver, uh, the city owns a lot of land for historic reasons. Uh, what you've done in Burlington is to buy land that was private land. But in our case, the city has a great deal of land that it has, which it makes, which some of which it has been making available for affordable housing. But generally, it's been selling that land. And my question is, why sell the land? Why not lease the land for 99 years for affordable housing? We, that happened to an extent at uh, Falls Creek South. The, the lease term was too short at 66 years, and that's creating a, uh, a problem now with restoration. Mm -hmm. But your land cost goes to zero, which means that the cost yes. of new housing is not going to be as high, although housing, housing construction costs here are still high. The second issue is one of scale, which you've talked about and which I think is a huge issue here. Community organizations, things like co-op housing, uh, co-housing, these are very, very, very small operations, 50, 75, maybe 100 uh, units. They're incredibly inefficient. I live in a, uh, uh, in a, it happens to be a strata, but it's four towers. It's downtown. It has uh, nearly 500 families, so 1,000 people at least uh, uh, live there, but it's one uh, one strata, and so we have our own staff. We have a single uh, uh, strata council. It's m so much more efficient because we have a scale that allows us yes. to do our own work rather than having to hire everything in. And uh, and isn't that a model for uh, CLTs as managers? Well. Uh... Uh, let me see if I'm understanding your question right. Uh, for us, scale has mattered. It's mattered. Uh, it's helped us to grow, actually, uh, to have the capacity we needed. We're actually the result of three mergers. We merged in two organizations, a co-op federation, uh, rental production, because in our small regions of Vermont, we, this, we couldn't all have the right capacity to really serve our region. So in that way, mm -hmm. for us, scale has mattered. And the other thing I'd say about the city owning free land is that owning land and being free is there's also an opportunity to maybe say we're going to develop some of this and maximize the return we sell to a developer and then use that to create affordability on other lands we own so that we can deeply subsidize. So there's a lot you can do when you actually own an asset like that, uh, different ways to parcel that out. But I agree. I think scale is important. I think uh, small organizations might need to look at, in our country now, we're really needing more and more to work together, and not, maybe not full merger, but to provide each other services so that we can maintain capacity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy Ambersoni. I work for Columbia Basin Trust, which is the community development organization in rural British Columbia trying to address affordable housing. Yep. Um, I found your remarks really compelling about the model and some of the lessons learned, the economies of scale, a lot of discussion around um, turning some challenges into opportunities, looking for intriguing partnerships. Um, what I'm curious about is um, the stuff that keeps you up at night in terms of the one or two risks that still face the Champlain Housing Trust and whether you'd be willing to share those with a few dozen of your close Canadian friends here. Um, <laughs> what are the things that That's haven't awesome. been mitigated away to your satisfaction and there are some lessons learned for us in looking at this kind of model in that? Uh that's a good question. There was much more risk when we were small. You know, one deal could take you down. But one of the things I've noted as we grow, we have intentionally, uh, with our last two strategic plans, uh, 
decided to use the stability financially that we found with growth to take more risk again. We really had to when we merged in these products. You know, there's always a time of consolidation and repair and where you say we've got to get our ducks in order, our house in order, we won't be able, no one will finance or whatever that. And as we repaired their existing portfolio and, and, and we built up our finances and strengthened the balance sheet, it meant we can go out and borrow more. It meant we can go out and say to the community, you, you're worried about the homeless dying this winter in the street. We'll buy something now and we'll have it ready by November, which is what we did. And we're intentionally taking more risk. And, and I think that is an important balance in an organization. And why one of the reasons I like the balance on the board, if everybody on our board were residents of our homes, it might be, it would make them too insecure to say, you're going to take what we've built with you and risk it all. But we have that balance to push us out to the community. And it's, I feel that the day we're not taking those risks for mission reason, not just, you know, um, we're not relevant anymore. So that is, you're right, that's an important sort of, measure and obviously you don't want to risk to the point that you put assets you've built up and people are relying on you we've had some consolidation i say and people who live in our housing we are first obligations to them but once you have it straightened out you got to use that to go and serve there's such a great 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 need um that's number one did that so i am i'm nervous about some of these new ventures <laughs> and we're using shorter term investment financing mm. but um it's for the right reason and we will have to deal and now that andy's not in the state everything's a little less risky <laughs> it's a little less fun <laughs> and exciting <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you he likes that see yeah so okay thank you <laughs> Hi, my name is Wayne Fougere, and I, I think my question is a little simpler. Okay. Um, I want to come at it. I'd like to hear about the person who decides to buy a home, yes. one of your shared equity homes. Yes. And I want to understand what I pay to who, how long the mortgage is. I, I heard you, not the mortgage, but the, uh, the lease. I heard yeah. you say you could give your house to your, um, to your descendants. Yeah. Yep. And so I'd really like to understand what that means to me, either as a person who does hand it down, mm -hmm. but with six kids, there's no way it's got to get split up. So if I decide to sell at the end of, yep. say, 40 years, yes. what happens? How much money am I getting? Yep. It's shared equity. I'm not getting it all. No. So okay. if you could start and just mm -hmm. tell us about what it takes me to get into it mm -hmm. and what I get out of it okay. at the end. The way our home buyers find us, and we serve people up to 100% in this program, um, is they come to the, we do financial education and home buyer education for anybody in the community. So that's been a great way to bring that benefit and bring people who need housing uh, to know us. And in that class, we help people get mortgage ready. And when they're done their class and they get their credit straight, they go to the bank, the paperwork's done. So, and then we, we just advise them where the good quality mortgages are. You could still get a 25, 30 year fixed in US and so that's what we're sending them to. But if they get all mortgage ready and their income and debt, they can afford 180,000 to mortgage, but all our homes are 260 and above. And they say, what am I going to do? We say, you could look at this program and see if it works for you. So people choose it. And then we have folks who are on the cusp and it's very interesting if people make sound financial decisions and they will, Look at it and say, should I? Uh, do I want to jump in and earn equity this way, or do I want to wait and try and save my down payment? You know, you might have a parent who could help you or something. So we just whatever people decide. So what happens when they go to sell is they notify us because it's the process, and we we become uh you know our homes are so affordable. And we have people coming through the classes looking at them. So we look at the sale part as a point of service as well, and people can sell their homes very quickly through us. Uh, whether they have a realtor or not, because we have this ready uh, buyer population. But people call us up, and it is important to have service at both points. Uh, people call us up, and then we, we have you come in. We get the home appraised again, because it's based on appraised value. And we sit down with you, and we find out what you've paid down on your mortgage, and we help you make the calculation. So you paid this much down on your mortgage, right? That's yours when you pay off your mortgage. Um, if you make capital improvements, they're appraised, and you get 100% of the value of those. And then with the appraisal to appraisal, let's say it's appraised 100,000 
dollars, which happens, you get 25,000 of them. And then we do a closing that's three ways. You sit down with the buyer and with us, and you see that benefit passed on to that buyer. We enter the chain of title every time because we really want to bootstrap the deal. Um, and also the, the leases we have are 99 years, but they're self-renewing. So if you uh, want to age out in your house and not sell it and you have a child that inherits it, that just continues. Um, and they restart at resale. But um, we've had cases where people died and we helped the children um, uh, deal with the estate and sell the home so they can have the capital. And we're just, again, we help them sell it. Um, and we have another buyer who, who moves in and, and, and that's how it works. So ju just one follow-up. Sure, of course. The, when you buy the home, when I think of lease, I think of paying a yearly or a a term lease, yes, whether it's okay. 99 years. It's 99 when years. When it turns over, yep. does someone pay more money? No. No, our lease fees are not designed to earn money for us. Our lease fees are just to cover the level of service we think people need. You know, we're there when you sell, we're there when you buy, we're there if you have trouble paying your mortgage, we're there. We have a lot of services to our homeowners, you know, uh, discounted repair money, sometimes grants, um, things like that. So people feel the support of the year member. Um, and, but the purpose of our lease is to have a contract between us and the owner of the home that makes it clear that they're on this lease and our purpose is to preserve the affordability at resale and the resale formula is in the lease. So that's what the instrument's really for. We also give a lot of rights to the owner that you wouldn't get in a conventional commercial lease. Um, and the leasehold value is mortgageable. So it's a slightly different instrument to what, as you say, a normal lease is to make more money. We have increased lease fees, but we never increase things on the people who already have a deal. We've increased our resale formula twice. Uh, and then if it's a benefit, we invite all the people already under the deal to come in and, and take up the new. But if it's actually like a cost, then we only do it going forward. So we've increased our lease fees um, as time went on. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you. I'm Herb Barbaletten with, I'm with Replan. Oh. Uh, cities more and more are the driving engine uh, economically of the countries. Uh, I hardly ever hear it talked about, but of the taxes collected by the federal and provincial governments or state governments, here, only seven to eight percent of those taxes come to cities. Mm -hmm. Why is why aren't people screaming about this? Do you think? Good question. Well, maybe this group would like to join you and advocate for that. I don't know. People are. I think people are not really aware how the systems work. And, and a lot of one of the reasons I've valued the community land trust model as we've developed with our membership is we educate our folks and we engage them and we do outreach and we feel like a community. And those folks advocate. We would have, and this is another thing, even if you gain a new benefit from your city or, uh, or state, you will lose it. People don't just keep doing good things because they're there. Somebody, we are city, folks have tried to overturn inclusionary zoning from the day we got it passed and it took several tries to get it passed. But we, our people will come out and they'll say, you know, we need affordable housing and that's what we have to do. If you're poor, you have the numbers. If you're wealthy, you have different kinds of power. And I really value the advocacy component. We had a Republican governor for eight years, and he tried to demolish the entire affordable housing network. And we just fought him tooth and nail and uh, succeeded hanging on. We succeeded hanging on to things. We didn't get much forward progress, but. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick uh, statement of fact. Um, I'm Chris Shelton. Um, the concept of affordable housing in Canada was decided by the federal government and all the provinces sometime in the 70s, I think 76, and it is 30% of total income of the family, which uh, total income is the top number on page three of your tax return. Okay. And it's calculated the same as in the States with uh, uh, heat, light, electricity, utilities included okay. for the renters, and there's another stream for the owner where it's there's mortgage payments, their mortgage payments. If you look at the mean income in Vancouver for a family 
the city of Vancouver has estimated at about $35,000, $38,000 mean in total income. Um, if you're paying $1,000 rent, mm -hmm. you take that number and multiply it by 40 mm -hmm. to get the taxable number of income that you should have to be affordable, uh, which means in British Columbia, Vancouver, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of people below that yes. formula. Yes. Thank you. That's the issue we have in our communities. You would have to make $30 an hour in our city to afford the market rent for your apartment. And most people are earning under 12, right? Your workforce. Even our professionals, a lot of them aren't making wages at that level. And I'll tell you what's happened. I talked about the decline of uh, affordable housing in our country. There is not a jurisdiction, a uh, metro jurisdiction in the country now where a minimum wage worker can afford an apartment. Think about the disconnect, you know, civic responsibility there. Just think about what that means for working people. And in our state, in our market, two people earning minimum wage can't make the rent. So it's two parents a minimum wage. They can't, you know, afford an apartment. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, hi, my name's Michael Brigham. I actually lived in Vermont for a couple of years, but down south in a tiny town, and they even had their own land trust, which is kind of amazing. Oh, who town, is it? We're, in Brattleboro. Yes, Brattleboro. Uh, yeah. That's now quite a sizable land trust. Yeah, it's kind of a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, but that was great. Uh, I just have two questions. Okay. One, aside from the sort of financial counseling and other instruments that you provide, are there any practices for moving people from tenancy to home ownership mm -hmm. within uh, mm -hmm. the CLT and then maybe even back at the end of their life that yes, you can share? Yes, very good point. And then two, um, you know, a lot of the projects that you were showing were large parcels of land that maybe you bought mm -hmm. um, you know, from a commercial property owner from the city. But I'm wondering if there's any experiments with cobbling together small parcels. Mm -hmm. So in Vancouver, we have a lot of laneway houses at yes. the back. I don't, you know, it's, is there a possible model for a CLT purchasing those, like mm -hmm. sub subdividing that property and then owning that, mm -hmm. like a little bungalow court or something like that, but smaller scale projects. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, uh, a lot of our, our portfolio in the city, in the neighborhood are three unit, four unit, five unit uh, buildings. And so that we have that, but we, we put them to finance them, make them affordable and manage them. We put them into bigger projects. We call them scattered site but each site is very small. I don't know if that meets your definition. But those three or, four or five unit buildings, are those tenants only or are they like joint ownership? Or Most of those are rental okay. um, and we have some co-op. We could do that for home ownership too. The other place where we do, we do spot things like we, you can buy a condominium with our program in a condo development that's market. So we initially, when we went to the suburban market, that was one of the great things is that we really integrated housing. You go down the street and you can't tell the land trust home from the next home. And uh, I think there's a great value to scattered site and, and integration like that when you can, getting people into other markets. Um, so our portfolio ranges from single places to, to bigger projects. It's hard to do big projects in Vermont. Now we have some rental developments of 160 apartments. That's huge in Vermont. You know, people aren't, it's not common, but they operate better. Um, and as far as the continuum, you, you hit on a very important point, I think, and that is through our continuum of housing, we really see the opportunity to give people security of tenure at any place where they are in their lives. And yes, people do move back down. One way we help homeowners who get into trouble uh, with their mortgage, if they can't really recover to pay for it, you know, whatever happened is not just one job loss. And then we will help them. We will buy the home before they go into delinquency and blow their credit, you know, and sell to another family. We will help them find a rental through us and get them into an affordable rental. So that's what the continuum means to us. Um, and also, for example, at the beginning fragile end of the continuum, we have these uh, properties with special needs with services on them for people who have you know, chronic mental health issues or trauma health issues and so on. And that gives that's a real safety net that we've developed with the service providers, but many of them graduate into our apartments. But what's terrific about our partnership is that I think the integration is important. But if they struggle there, that will happen when trauma, you know, then they can move back to the 
the housing was serviced and we rent the apartment. So we do see the portfolio as security and, and opportunity. And we've had people move back to rental just because they wanted to or needed, you know, family-wise or age-wise. That's happening too. My name is Bill Day. Um, I was transfixed at your description of the actions of your Republican governor. Um, did he, it was a he, was it? It was a he, thank you, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> did, did he enunciate his rationale, his logic, or was it just an action where we have to presume what the, what the drivers were? Yes, I could sum up what he was about, unleash the private sector. He really was a private market guy. He didn't want to spend any money civically on any civic needs. He thought that government should work and the private developers should develop housing. And he had that rap about, you know, just grace, create, increase supply and it'll all get more affordable. And, uh, but he, he really, he was just driven by a belief in the private sector and, and also to be able to cut funding and save um, money and not fund programs. It was very difficult. I spent a lot of time with that guy trying to change his mind, because I'm like, well, you're fiscal conservative. This is a very fiscally conservative. You know, I never convinced him. So I like to believe. Sorry, Daniel. Um, that, was, that, was, that was not the intention of me standing up to the podium. Um, um, as we're documenting all these questions for, uh, for our final report to the Real Estate Foundation, so I thought I'm going to ask a really basic question, because we're looking at community land trust as a tool to create housing affordability. So how are our land trusts able to create housing affordability in a way that a typical nonprofit would not be able to do that? What is different from a, a, a nonprofit? Mm -hmm. The difference in the community land trust is really community land trusts are place-based. You could have a big service area. It could be a province if they guess, but you know, and then you serve people there and you commit to keeping those properties affordable or in community use. And most nonprofits in housing do that. Although uh, a number of nonprofits, you know, we've all had to be, as I say, more social entrepreneurs. And some community land trusts will, or uh, community organizations who do housing that aren't committed to permanent affordability may say, well, we have this property we developed, and now that site's worth a whole lot of money, and we can sell that and use that money to develop in another neighborhood. So it's just a different ethic about the rights of our residents. Um, and also how you use the wealth and resources of your property. We have a mechanism in land trust where if we need to sell off a property, we go to the membership as a process, but if it's really not a good property and needs to go out, people will make that decision. But by and large, otherwise, we're saying we're committed to this communities in this neighborhood. In our country, too, we also have big nonprofits who specialize that are multi-state, especially in the senior housing, they're multi-state, and they do senior housing. So they're pretty much like any other absentee, technical. I mean, they're social landlord. They do the programs, but they don't have that commitment to how you might feel about your apartment, your community, your neighborhood. So um, that's the biggest difference for us. But also we have... Um, a lot of nonprofits uh, certainly have not wanted to do permanently affordable home ownership. They think that you know they should just keep subsidizing home ownership and for the few who get the break. And and also we have uh, affected our our policy in the sense that more and more states are making nonprofits commit to 40 years or 50 years of affordability in their rentals through the funding, whereas it used to be, you know, it's 15 years, it's 15 years. So um, I think that's the essential difference. Hi, uh, my name is Gordon Borkstrom. I work for a small rural development group in the interior. Uh, thanks very much for a, a really interesting session. Um, one of the things I guess I wanted to ask and um, been doing a bit of research on this and as you say 200 CLTs in the states I think it's amazing I think some people may not know and uh, recently I was down in Washington State and sort of struck by the irony of San Juan Islands mm -hmm. they have three CLTs on the major islands yes. and I was struck by the irony one of their projects they're barging uh, old heritage homes yeah. they're slated for demolition in Victoria yeah. barging them to San Juan Island, huh. uh, renovating them uh, for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was interesting. Um, if I understood your stats right, when you said the split between sort of one-third shared equity and two-thirds rental, 
Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering in the financing of Champlain, do you find like, I guess I was thinking the shared equity model, am I right? The one of the advantages is the ability to bring in that financing through the mortgages Leverage that are brought in. Yes. What holds us back on home ownership is that initial capital subsidy to take a home that's worth $260,000 and make it affordable to someone who can afford so much less. So we're actually buying some uh, B sort of rental property and converting. And what we do there is we don't want to displace the people. So we, you know, we give them a long period. We give them uh, all home buyer education uh, and help them to buy their homes. And often we just had did a development where the folks have been renting there for 25 years and then they bought it through our program. Now they own it, we fix it up. Uh, but we won't displace anybody doing that economically. And um, we're always trying to find that affordable stock and that initial subsidy. Once it's in, it really does work like magic on homeownership. And you're right, people leverage their own mortgage. And, but uh, we're, we're really capped by the initial subsidy. And that's one of our big fights nationally is what programs are left are uh, in mostly rental financing. And um, we're trying to get more, more of that initial capital for home. In fact, the HUD secretary just came to Burlington, and that's what I said to him. We should do go big, invest in this. So, um, but I think, again, he may not listen to me. I don't know. So uh, that would be. And you asked something else. Uh, it's just the split between the rental and the Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? That's it. Oh, one more. Sorry, you thought you could go home now. Thank you very much for the talk. It's very stimulating. Um, I'm Jay Bancroft. I live in Falls Creek, Creek South and in one of the stratas on lease land. So in the, uh, you know, it's particular to us. I'm hoping it, it bears some relevance to the wider issue of affordable housing in the province, but um, hopefully we'll all ask it anyway, yeah. in that we're transitioning from one situation to another situation mm -hmm. and also embrace the idea of, you know, the community being involved in the decision making yes. and yes. developing the model. Yes. Some will not want this, oh. others will. Mm -hmm. So you talked about a model where you had a strata with some market housing and some um, community or some affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Was it all owned by or all leased land? Was it all part and parcel of the community land trust? How did yeah. that work? Can you help us understand that a bit more? Well, and might it apply to yes. our situation? Yeah. We, we subsidized that development overall. We, I mean, we made it affordable. All the condominiums in that building were affordable, but they weren't all re price restricted. Um, and uh, I, I'm sorry. What was your question about how it worked? I'm sorry. Well, some of them are market. Yes. And some of them are yes. not. Yes. Yeah. So I'm wondering, we're wondering if that model might apply to, say, a strata where some of the mm -hmm. owners mm -hmm. want to yeah. keep it as market housing and yeah. some want to enter and some may need to enter into yes, yes. an affordable situation. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's hard if um, I can't comment on, you know, people have an existing situation and how will they adapt, as you say, to the change in, in the structuring and pricing, you could do it at sale. Certain ones become affordable. Uh, but uh, we like to do mixed income wherever there's a large development. We don't do a lot of market housing. We did it there because it was 60 condos and we couldn't fund 60 condos, uh, but wanted that integrated. That was scale for our community. Um, and we do that in our rentals, like the one on the waterfront, there's 40 apartments, so we have like four that are market. We don't do a lot of market, but that, that we do very low income, moderate income, uh, and then we might do some market. And we're actually doing more of that affordable market now, because again, that's a gap. You know, as I said, the working people who can't afford the, can't get into our deeply affordable and can't afford the market. So I think you have a lot of decisions when people already live somewhere. I think that is one of the values of the community development approach, which is doing it with and, and by the community and not for them. And that engagement, it is going to take a lot of process and a lot of people are, but you know, it'll be worthwhile because what you create will hold. Uh, you'll have balance in your community. 
not everybody ever is going to be really happy, but I think you can achieve, um, you know, a solid uh, benefit. Thanks. Don McKenzie, some uh, involvement with Metro Vancouver Alliance. Uh, I thought perhaps you might speak a bit more about uh, London, England post 2012. You uh, touched on it briefly. I add my voice to the chorus of praise for your work here this evening, Thank effective you. and helpful. Um, it seems to me that uh, in the bid they said they were going to do something and uh, they've been doing it and will be continuing to do it. Also, we have people involved with Metro Vancouver Alliance who take a very uh, salutary interest, I, I would say, in social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. can, can you articulate a, a cogent contention that uh, doing the kind of job you're doing in terms of providing people with housing mm -hmm. actually has uh, meaningful beneficial impacts on uh, health care costs for a community and a society. Thank you. This is something I think that has become, as people are struggling in housing more and more, um, there's a doctor in the U.S. who's become quite famous for saying housing's a vaccine. I wish I could provide, uh, you know, write a prescription and get people housing. And our solution has been to look at our homeless population, get to know the people who are get to know them personally, what are their needs, and we are, we, our goal is to end chronic homelessness. So homelessness is only emergency as it used to be instead of it becoming this constant state. And many of the chronically homeless are people who are ill. And um, this recent sort of convergence with health care, which health care is picking up a lot of the costs of communities not having healthy places for their folks, our hospital just gave us $3 million to do more of that kind of housing as a grant because when they did their first housing with us for people they were discharging and were homeless, we were just providing a temporary situation in that case. And they measured what happened to those folks and they were 60% less likely to need to go back to the hospital and be ill and it saved the hospital 40 of what they would have spent. So they're giving us money now, recognizing, that, yes, that housing is health care. And that's actually one of the uh, big advocacy um, uh, movements around the country because it's a reality that people are now facing. And with the Affordable Care ha Act, there is incentive to hospitals to do community-based health instead of just treating disease. And, uh, and so it's, it's t pushing the hospitals out to look at these solutions, and boy, they've discovered housing in a big way. Yeah, and I think that's an important area. It's the first non-housing money we've gotten into housing in so long. You know, when you do affordable housing, the government says, please ha house these people, please address this need, please address, people. you know, all needs we want to, but they never add housing. You know, they want us to serve people coming out of prisons and not hold people in prisons because they don't have housing, but they will not take the money they bond to build prisons and make provide it to us so we can do housing. But the health care system is starting to realize they have an immediate gain. Um, uh, and, and that's a partnership that we are definitely going to build on in our community, and we won't stop until we have housed all the chronically homeless folks. I think on that note, I, better, I think I have to get going on that note. Thank you.